Hello, everyone. Is the mic okay? Maybe I'll raise it a little. Oh, okay, good. Yeah, I guess I can speak loudly enough over this beautiful music. <laughs> That's fine. It's really not a big deal. As long as we have beautiful music, we might as well have a beautiful painting, right? I, 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 uh, my secret hobby is that I'm an oil painter and I slaved over this for a very long, this is, no, 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 I'm kidding. This, uh, maybe while we're getting set up, uh, good, I think we're good. Uh, so I'll, I'll tell you at the outset that this is actually a product of GPT-4. So I have my $20 a month GPT-4 account and I said something to the effect of, give me an image of Paris, make string theory and machine learning be a part of the game. So this, this stuff, this sort of garbage in here is its interpretation of, of neural networks and string theory or something like that. And I, uh, it gave me some very clean images. I said, no, 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 make it impressionist. And it, this is what it came up with. So, uh, you know, one of the things that we get to, to grapple with is how are we supposed to think about this very powerful tech in the context of science? And that's a little bit of one of the things that this talk is about. But before that, let me first of all thank the organizers for the wonderful invitation. Uh, it's kind of seldom that I see this many people together in a room for a meeting that isn't one of the big yearly conferences. So it's uh, just a testament to the effort you guys put in to get so many wonderful people here. Um, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about some of the things that's been happening in, in uh, the machine learning corner of string phenomenology the last few years. Uh, and that is uh, a little bit separate from some of the things that we talk about at String Data, which is our, our yearly meeting. People are doing increasingly broad things, and I'm going to try to focus on the string theory aspects today. But first, let me tell you a little bit, if you want to connect in this area, there's a couple of ways to do that. First of all, uh, I am pleased to be a part of the NSF AI Institute for Artificial Intelligence and Fundamental Interactions, where we want to advance physics knowledge from the smallest building blocks of nature to the largest structures in the universe, and hopefully in the process to galvanize AI research. This is a Boston area NSF-supported institute, uh, MIT, Harvard, Northeastern, and Tufts. And we do a lot of different things. We're about 150 people in total when you consider faculty and postdocs and, uh, and students. So you can check out our website and our seminars and our colloquia and our summer schools and workshops and so forth. Uh, we have a couple of postdoc offerings at Northeastern this year that I am shamelessly advertising. Uh, some of them are in connections with ML if you like this talk, uh, but there's also some that Fabi and Rula and Sarah, and Sarah Harrison have that don't necessarily need to involve ML. So you're, if you're interested, please, uh, please apply. And finally, there's a couple of upcoming meetings uh, in the next six weeks, actually. So if, you haven't, if you've been looking for something over the holidays, uh, consider coming to Caltech. There's a machine learning and math meeting in a, in a few weeks there that is followed immediately by String Data 2023. That's like 10 days before Christmas. And then in the middle of January, we have Strings, Fields, and Deep Learning at the Aspen Center for Physics. Uh, the meetings look very exciting. There are a couple of more spots if people want to join, so definitely send me an email. OK. So uh, the necessary motivation, in the back of my mind at least, is that string theory and quantum gravity are hard. <laughs> this does not uh, need any introduction to this audience. Uh, but given that they're hard, you, there's a question that's fun to do in a, in, in a meeting or to uh, potentially discuss over a few beers with friends, which is if you let yourself ignore the hardness for a moment uh, and just ask, what would we want to do in principle if we weren't concerned about the hardness of the theory and just said, what is it, what is it we want to do? Uh, this is something that in computer science you might consider uh, being asking an oracle. So when people talk about complexity theory, they might ask, how many oracle calls do you get to make? And so on and so forth. Uh, and basically, the idea is that the oracle is like some all-powerful being that is able to answer any question that you ask it. And uh, so in that context, I, I, you know, what in principle would, would we want to ask about string theory and quantum gravity? Um, so a couple of things that you might ask if you didn't worry about hardness, and you're going to laugh a little bit when I, when I write, write these things down, you might want to ask the oracle, what is the complete non-perturbative definition of M-theory? That this is something that uh, really, to get where we want to in the long run, having better non-perturbative formal control over the theory is, is something we'd like. But if the oracle in, in, the one rule of this game is that you're not just allowed to ask the oracle, is string theory correct? It's like, <laughs> you need to do a little bit better than that. So first, you'd want to ask, what is the complete non-perturbative definition of M-theory? Then you'd want to say, pardon me? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, 
I actually don't know any French, so I have no clue whether that's funny or not. But what, what, what does this say? Huh? Replace, <laughs> replace the lamp. <laughs> that's, an, that's, a, that's a very interesting, uh, yeah. OK, good. I don't know. Very good. So if you, uh, if you knew a complete non-perturbative definition of M theory and you could, you could uh, ask the oracle, you would say, what are all of the decay, what, what are all of the vacua? And not only that, I want to know all of the decay rates of all of the vacua, and I want to know the decay, I want to know the branching ratios from, you know, vacuum I into vacuum J and so on and so forth. And again, this is supposed to be laughably complicated because we know how hard it would be to get this information, but the oracle doesn't care because the oracle can provide it. And then you might ask, what is the way to think about the cosmological measure or some other measure that you're interested in for some reason? And then you might ask something like, sorry, how do you make the, how, given this sort of setup where you know all of the information about all of the vacua and you know the cosmological measure, then it's still hard to make statistical predictions because these ca calculations are big and complicated. So at many places along this story, maybe not as much here, there's just concrete computational questions. But if this is a dream that feels very unattainable, maybe two points come out of it very clearly. One is that we need formal theory. There's just no way around it. Um, but given that list that we want to know as much about all of the vacua as we can, and then we want to understand how they decay from one to another, and we want to understand statistics and so forth, I think even though we need formal theory, there's no question that we just need smart computation. And so that's part of the, the setup for how I think about why I'm doing ML in this context and why the community is interested in it. Uh, that we need formal theory, and I think clearly at the end of the day, we're also going to need computation. Okay. And that's probably not that controversial. So we've been doing this for a little while. Uh, a few caveats and comments from the modern era of thinking about machine learning and string theory together. Uh, first of all, a number of string pheno for folks are working on ML, and they have interesting non-string pheno offshoots. I will cite some references, but uh, interesting works that have nothing to do with string theory I'm generally not going to talk much about today. Um, using large language models for research, ML or otherwise, is very cool and interesting. It's something uh, that I sometimes do in my own research. I implement these things in my class. That is an exciting topic that's worth a, a talk of its own. I won't talk about it here. Feel free to ask me questions uh, either in the, the Q&A or, uh, or afterwards. Um, to those working in this area, replace the lamp. Um, my, my sincere apologies if I didn't adequately cite, cover, or present your work. Uh, I tried pretty hard, but there's clearly some things that I'm going to miss. Uh, and if you'd like, please raise your exciting results in Q&A. But if you do that, please do it briefly so that it doesn't totally uh, dominate the conversation. Uh, another comment is that increasingly we're thinking about statistics in more sophisticated ways. I will use some statistics language throughout this talk, like sampling and drawn from which might sound gross, but the fact of the matter is, is that if you have ever done a computation in an actual string compactification, you yourself have sampled string data, whether you like it or not, because you picked your Calabia somehow and you wrote it down to be able to do your computations. So even though statistics is not the natural language of our field, I think that some of these things are inevitably happening behind the scenes, and we need to think a little bit harder about that. And finally, some numerical techniques can be rigorous. Uh, rigor is a loaded term I have uh, learned recently in some discussions. Uh, so what I mean by rigor is what you presumably mean by rigor, which is results that have zero error. In some other communities that use ML and physics, they're perfectly happy to allow for statistical convergence. So lattice field theorists in the infinite data limit do exactly converge to the right distribution that they're trying to draw their lattice field configurations from, defined by the action. Uh, but I don't mean statistical convergence. I really mean zero error, zero error results. So in this context, you can either think of that in the context of applying ML and making it rigorous or using ML theory. Okay. Very good. Okay, so the outline is as follows. First, I need to give you some machine learning preliminaries. I'm going to tell you about neural networks. I'm going to tell you why neural networks are strong. It's due to something called the universal approximation theorem. But the universal approximation theorem is why they're strong but it doesn't help you find the neural network that is the good approximator of the function you're trying to, to approximate. For that, you need wise architectures, which is about how you stitch together small functions into big functions in a way that makes sense based on your data. And then I'll talk about some famous examples and some verbs that help you understand the different types of machine learning out there. Then I'll run through a section of the talk that I call cursory glances. In the end, this section and the next one aren't quite so different. Um, these are going to be shorter looks at some things that are happening. I'm going to tell you about prediction problems in string theory associated with supervised learning. 
I'm going to tell you about some cases where you can be rigorous, where you can generate some conjectures and, uh, and, and prove some theorems. I'll tell you about structure in data coming from something called persistent homology. I'll tell you about search problems and how you might do them in string theory with reinforcement learning, genetic algorithms, and quantum annealers. And then I'll pass to a part of the talk that I'm calling in-depth looks, where I will tell you why, why you might want to auto-differentiate everything. And I'll tell you about some recent work in this context uh, for flux vacua. And then finally, I'll talk about some flows. Namely, uh, Magdalena is going to give a great talk next on Calabia metrics, and I'll tell you about uh, some mathematical ways of thinking what's happening associated with those geometric flows, motivated by some recent results in neural network theory. Uh, and if I have time at the end, uh, I'll tell you about generative models and simulating uh, string theory and, and statistical inference. Uh, I, I have a lot of slides. I'm not sure if I'll get here, so I guess I guess if I don't get there, I'll just have to give up on my dreams and still move forward. So, um, very good. Okay, so this is the outline. I should encourage you, please interrupt me at any point. I'm happy to take questions throughout. Um, but I guess at this point, there probably aren't any. Okay, so preliminaries. Let me tell you about neural networks, about universal approximation, and also about architectures. Uh, I will then give you some famous examples and their associated verbs. I think sometimes when you talk to computer scientists or you hear it in the news, a neural network is uh, posed as something that sounds much more complicated than it is. I think for our community that likes to think mathematically, we can just think of a neural network as a parametrized function. So it's just some function with some parameters in it. It is typically a big function. We normally don't describe functions by words like big or small necessarily. Um, but by big function, I mean a function that is composed out of many other simpler, simpler functions with many parameters that at its essence, basically every neural network architecture that you've heard about uh, is some sort of parametrized function that is big and composed out of simpler things. Um, these neural networks have many parameters in them. In modern incarnations, it's something like billions. Uh, and therefore, um, you can think with these parameters as there's some sort of parameter space. Those parameters get stuck into the function. And therefore, what the neural network is doing is inducing some sort of map from parameter space to function space. Typically, uh, when you start it on your computer, those parameters come from somewhere. They're drawn from some parameter distribution, P of theta, when you initialize your computer. And uh, that parameter distribution affects the statistics of the neural networks. If you'd like, you can think of the choice of this uh, parameter density on the parameters as effectively putting statistics on the function space associated to the neural network precisely because the neural network is a map from parameter space to function space. So if you'd like, this defines a field theory, and that's something that I've been interested in recently. But that is not the subject of this talk. So this is the simplest example. This is uh, Rosenblatt 1954 or something like that. This is something called the perceptron. F of x, I promised you, it is a function. Uh, these w's and b's, w is our matrices and b's are vectors. Those are the parameters. I promised you parameters. So this is a parametrized function. Uh, good. This is uh, something called an affine input layer. Sigma is an element-wise nonlinearity, and uh, this is an affine transformation to output that defines this thing called the perceptron. And basically, the most vanilla type of deep neural network that people study is basically compositions of this thing that just compose it more and more times with itself. I also promised you that uh, parameters are drawn from some distribution in, in it, and this is a typical choice here, where n is the normal distribution. Okay. So a neural network is a parametrized function. That doesn't get us very far unless there's some reason to think uh, that those parametrized functions might be useful for something. And that's where these universal approximation theorems come in. So these multilayer perceptrons, which is Rosenblatt 1958, uh, actually, this is the architecture I just told you about. Uh, they're universal approximators, which basically means that they can, with some certain assumptions attached, approximate any function. Uh, and the error is of order 1 over n. So if we talk about the approximation, we want to say, how bad is the error from the ground truth? And uh, it's 1 over n, where n is the width of the neural network. So just for context, this direction here, or alternatively, the dimension of this vector in here is called the width. You can make the width big by making the neural network big and the parameters big. And in that limit, you're going to get better and better and better approximations to uh, to any arbitrary function. There are different versions of this, like many famous theorems in sort of stats and computer science. There's sort of different versions on the same thing. Uh, and so for that, I encourage you to read up. Yeah. Pardon me? 
Uh, this is neither. I haven't talked about training yet. This is the question in the function space associated with the neural network. Is there a function somewhere that can approximate any arbitrary function? Um, and so I haven't talked about training yet, which is a very good point, because the existence of such a function in the function space does not mean that it's easy to find. And that's why training is non-trivial. Yeah, good question. Thanks for interrupting, and please keep it up. Um, good. So uh, on the other hand, uh, I, I, this is why they're powerful. But because uh, you have this, uh, you're, it means that somewhere in the function space, you can, in principle, uh, approximate any function. But it doesn't mean that you can actually figure out what that function is. So what we do in practice is we come up with clever architectures, is the phrase. Uh, an architecture is how you stitch the simple functions into complex ones. So for example, the architecture here uh, in this previous example is this one. Um, and that's the feed-forward neural network. Uh, but there's others. So for example, a convolutional neural network is something that works very well on image data, because image data has local features. And you could train a convolutional network to identify the Eiffel Tower. And in this case, it would pick off this local feature using a convolutional kernel. Uh, the transformer, which you've heard a lot about recently in the context of GPT, because that's the T in GPT, is something that works very well with language data. Uh, that can be much broader than you might think, because, for example, uh, word problems in group theory, uh, for example, associated with the braid group, are uh, very naturally thought of as language, and you can apply these techniques there. But in any given problem, the sort of question that you want to ask is, what is the structure of my data? What am I trying to do with it? And how do I choose my architecture such that I might succeed as, as well as possible on my problem? So um, even though we have universal approximation in these very simple models, in principle, it's hard to, in practice, it's hard to find the good approximations. And so we choose architectures to make our lives easier. OK, so here's some famous examples. This is a database called MNIST. This is supervised learning, where you learn to predict, uh, given one of these little images, you learn to predict whether it's a 2 or a 9 or so forth. So supervised learning is about labeled data, where each little image here has a label, 9, 8, 4, 2, 7, et cetera, associated with it, and you learn to predict. Um, good. So some of uh, my slides might be a little off due to some last minute changes. So this is alpha 0 down here. Alpha 0 and alpha go are a very famous example where you use reinforcement learning to search or play. And these are uh, the world's best at chess, Go, and Shogi right now. Of course, um, I have to talk about generative models. Generative models are about generating or simulating data. In this example, this was a text to image generative model. I gave GPT-4 some prompts, and I played with it for five or 10 minutes to look at various different examples. I said Paris, string theory, impressionism, neural networks, et cetera, and this is what it came up with. And there's actual, I'd be happy to give examples of ways in which there's huge failure modes where things are obviously wrong, not necessarily with this image, but with other images that are like it. But at the same time, we should really be pretty impressed that uh, you can get this sort of thing out from text. So it's generating or simulating data. And finally, there's also text-to-text -text generative models. So I wanted some sort of haiku uh, based on this conference. And it said, in Paris, thread weave, threads weave, string theories, vast landscape, Eiffel echoes deep. Uh, but if you actually count, this is not 575. This is actually 565 associated with the haiku. So it got something slightly wrong. But nonetheless, these are very famous examples that are out there that demonstrate the power of these models. And something that increasingly large numbers of people are interested in is, given the power of this sort of stuff, how can we use it for science? OK? Good. Any questions before the next part of the talk? That's just the backdrop. OK. All right. So I'm going to give you some cursory glances at some various works that are out there um, uh, in this community. So first of all, uh, and in the process, I'll tell you some more details about some of these machine learning techniques. Um, some of the early string and ML papers were using something that's called supervised learning. I won't cover too many of the results from this work, but I want to tell you about the basic setup because it's the most essential type of machine learning. The data here is a set of input-output pairs. Uh, so it could be uh, you know, some polytope and some property of the polytope. It could be uh, an image and the label associated with the image. Is it a hot dog or not, uh, for instance? Um, and given that data, the input-output pairs, the basic idea is that you want some sort of parametrized model, f of theta, uh, that is going to make predictions given some element of x. And you want to see how well that prediction compares to the ground truth label y that you have. 
So in this context, you have something called a loss function that takes two elements of y and gives you some real number that tells you about the goodness of fit. So for example, in linear regression, we typically do mean squared error that says, you know, given my line that is my parameterized model, I go through all the data points and I see how well the line fits the data points and I add up the square errors and that's some notion of how good the fit of the line is. But given a line that fits really badly in linear regression, linear regression is the simplest supervised learning, basically what you do is you do some sort of optimization on theta to try to minimize L on the data, for example, uh, for example via gradient descent. So if Y is MX plus B, you want it to run through the data and you just optimize M and B to be able to fit it. So that is supervised learning. Something that uh, is interesting about supervised learning, which was sort of my first bit of interest in this context, um, this is how I got into it. Hold on. Nope, too far. Okay, good. Um, so uh, this was one of the things that, uh, from this paper that we wrote a few years ago, that I still think is uh, really interesting. Um, it's the idea of doing something that we called conjecture generation, where you uh, get rigorous results out of ML and not just numerical ones. The basic idea that we had is to use any ML algorithm, supervised or otherwise, on some interesting problem, then depending on the details, you might imagine that there's some way to open the box to identify some sort of key decision variable. And then based on that decision variable, uh, there, you could bring in some human expertise. In the context of this problem, it was an F-theory problem, so I was someone that had some expertise there. And bringing the human in, you might be able to see the decision variable that's crucial to making the decision about uh, about what the ML model is predicting, and then it might suggest some sort of conjecture that you might iterate and you might prove a theorem. So in this particular context, we were interested in how visible like sectors might arise in a particularly large ensemble of F-theory geometries. There was some crucial decision variable that was appearing with probability like one out of 200 or 500 or something like that. Uh, associated to E6 grand unification, and we were able to prove a theorem about this. So, so uh, this can maybe be taken with a grain of salt, but this idea is an interesting idea generally uh, that some other people have been doing as well in our community. So for example, um, uh, Andre and company uh, studied line bundle cohomology, dimensions of line bundle cohomology uh, in various setups, and uh, you, know, you can see uh, some of the results here. It was observed recently that line bundle cohomology has been des de described by dividing the Picard lattice into certain regions. Sorry, it's a little small. Uh, in each of those regions, the cohomology dimension is predicted by a polynomial formula. So in particular, it, when you divide up PIC in these contexts, you find that there's piecewise polynomial descriptions that are good models for the cohomology dimension. And in various cases, they were able to take this I mean, both from a numerical perspective and from a math perspective, this is the right sort of structure that emerges. And they were able to study examples where they proved some theorems uh, about the structure of those piecewise polynomials, Hodge numbers. Similarly, um, uh, a, a, a group connected with, with uh, the Penn group and elsewhere was studying line bundle cohomology and associated jumps in F-theory. They were interested in studying vector-like Higgs pairs that are arising in 4D F-theory models for phenomenological reasons. And uh, they white boxed the machine learning approach uh, that provided some intuition for jumps that were due to curve splittings, jumps uh, in the cohomology that were associated with uh, uh, new vector-like pairs appearing on subloci and moduli space. Uh, so this was ML-inspired intuition for vector pairs. Uh, a famous result from 2021 that I can't help but mention, maybe this is the one really non-string theory result from the talk, uh, there's a DeepMind paper from 2021 that did conjecture generation in the context of knot theory. Um, and basically, one thing that they were asking, given some knot and some associated topological invariants, like the hyperbolic volume, like the signature, like the Jones polynomial, et cetera, they were interested in the question, can you predict the knot signature from the geometric invariants? So if I have a bunch of knots, and I compute a bunch of topological invariants, and then I want to ask, if I don't feed it the signature, can I predict the signature accurately given those other ones? Uh, this was something that they were able to eventually prove a theorem about. And the way that they did it was uh, they trained a neural network F and they did something called gradient saliency. So these X's here are these various topological invariants here that are appearing on the left. Uh, and basically what they were asking is uh, for the gradient saliency of, of any individual feature at input, any individual uh, topological invariant, they're basically asking how much does the prediction of the network change if you vary one of the topological invariants at input a little bit. And this very simple analysis, asking about the response of the neural network to a fluctuation in one of the topological invariants, uh, 
gives you this graph that tells you that some of the topological invariants are much more important than the others, and some of them almost don't matter at all. So that's the sort of result that can come out of this numerical algorithm that when you, um, when you bring in a team of not theorists and then you give them this data, and then they start thinking hard about how these topological invariants are related to the not signature, they can end up writing, writing down a conjecture and proving a theorem. And so this is the theorem that they proved in this nature paper. They also have some representation theory results, but this is a great example in ML for Math of how they took um, some honest to God numerical techniques that had error that were not always correct. They have this way of opening up the box and understanding what's happening, and based on that, they have a theorem that they didn't have before. Okay. So, um, so this is their results in the context of not theory. Um, no. Yeah, that's a great question. So there's all sorts of different techniques one might do other than this. There's something called layer-wise relevance propagation. Then there's simple things like just use a decision tree. Uh, apparently, there's some uh, skepticism about the breadth of applicability of gradient saliency techniques in the ML community. I haven't followed that closely. Um, in this case, it worked. But in general, uh, these sorts of things are considered to be brittle, and you need to be careful when you're using them. Uh, yes, that's true. That's absolutely true. Um, that would be one failure mode. Uh, they didn't have that in this case, but uh, you can find machine learning literature expressing both excitement and skepticism about these sorts of ideas. And in any given example, the question is, did it work? Yeah. Good. Um, a a another thing that you can ask, uh, this was about sort of getting rigor out. Another thing that you ask is, can, is about the, the structure of data. And I would like to, uh, before talking about the, the details of persistent homology, I'd just like to get at the idea, first of all, that sometimes when we talk about data, we have a data manifold. And even if we don't have a data manifold, we might have a data topological space, right? So I'm just imagining that I have a data manifold M that's in some ambient space A. For example, in this community, we think about Calabiaz and ambient spaces all of the time. Alternatively, uh, okay, not a manifold, but you could think about the space of stabilized vacua in moduli space, the space of flux vacua, and we'll see an example of that in a second. And given that, given that data manifold, M in general has geometry, topology, et cetera, and if you want to understand your problem, you'd better understand the geometry and topology of that space. But a problem arises when you remember that whether you're picking your favorite Calabiao or picking your favorite 100 Calabiaos, uh, we are always sort of sampling from the data manifold. In no case in string theory, generally speaking, are we able to understand and control the entirety of the data manifold. We do samples, period. That's, that's what we do. And given those samples, uh, x's drawn from some density, some probability density on the data manifold, what you would get is some sort of point cloud uh, in the ambient space. And you want to ask the question, how can I recover the information about the topology and or geometry of uh, that space, the fundamental thing, if I only know samples. So in this particular case, I have three examples of 10 samples, 50 samples, and, and uh, this, should be, this should be like 100 or 250 samples. From the annulus, in this case, 10 samples doesn't look like the annulus at all. In this case, it's starting to look more and more annulus-like, and at this point, I have enough samples that it's very clearly an annulus. So in the context of a scientific application or string theory, there's questions of if we only take a few samples, what sorts of things are really there that we might miss because we only had a finite number of examples? What structure is really there that we want to uncover from samples? Fortunately, mathematicians, um, okay, so, so uh, in the context of if you knew M itself, you would ask about the Hodge numbers and the topology and homology and so forth. Uh, but if you only had the samples, you'd ask, how would I recover information about the topology of M given only those samples? So mathematicians, uh, uh, I think it's 20 or 30 years old, Gary knows a lot more about the history than I do, came up with persistent homology. Persistent homology is the idea that you have a one-parameter family of simplicial complexes that yields homology families HK. The HK depends on the samples and some filtration parameter T. Uh, the simplest version of this is something called the vitoris rips complex. Basically, the vitoris rips complex is formed as follows. It, first of all, it depends on delta. And to each k-point subset of the samples that are within a delta ball of each other, you can study those things, you want to add a k-1 simplex to the simplicial complex. 
So this is an example of the Vitoris rips complex being applied to this particular point cloud. And you can see certain triangles, edges, and tetrahedra appearing. And given that simplicial complex, you can talk about its homology. So this is an algorithm given a parameter delta and a set of samples to write down a simplicial complex and talk about its homology. The basic idea there uh, is that uh, the homology and the Hodge numbers will jump uh, as a function of this filtration parameter delta. That is, sometimes a cycle will be born where there's some jump up in the homology as you increase delta, and sometimes a cycle will die. So in the context of the annulus, here, if delta is super small, the, uh, if, if delta is like epsilon, this is just 10 disconnected points still, 10 disconnected little balls. H0 is 10, H1 is 0. But as you make this delta bigger and bigger, these things eventually start to merge. And let's do it on this data set, actually. As they merge more and more, eventually you'll be able to go around here and then at some point, delta becomes so big that the interior here gets filled in, and H1 drops back down, and the one cycle dies. Okay? So this is this beautiful idea. Um, I think it's natural, given that we're always working with samples. Um, and so that's what people have been applying in the context of string theory. So that's, that's persistent homology. It's very natural. It's just a one-parameter family of homology theories that you apply to some data set to uncover the structure of the theory. So in the context of, uh, there's a couple of works in the context of string theory that, 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 that do this. Uh, this is uh, one of Gary's, yeah, sure. Yep. So, some, some, Yeah, so in the example I'm, I'm, I'm going to get to in a second, it's not a priori clear what the underlying data manifold is. In this case, it's obvious what it is, and I'm just trying to develop the numerical techniques that can recover the fact that this, an this is clearly an annulus, right? Uh, this is drawing from a... Yeah, you, you can, you, for, for example, fluxes. Yeah, for example, fluxes. And so if you don't know about the underlying structure that you're drawing your data from, if there's some, if, if there's some mystery, you might ask, given the data, how can I understand the topology? So this is just an example. If you didn't know what an annulus was and you were just handed this, clearly there's something going on here where there's a direction. But in this version, I mean, if you make the marker size small enough, there's simply no overlap. It's just a collection of points. But it's a collection of points that somehow is arranged very nicely into a circle. And you'd like numerical techniques that can address that. Good. All right. Um, very good. So Gary did this in the context of uh, a flux vacua. So these are two B uh, flux vacua on the rigid Calabi Yau uh, and the associated axiodiliton values. And for the different flux vacuum here, there's very clearly circles and voids here that are actually appearing in the actual string theoretic data that you would like to be able to uncover and understand. And this is, this is uh, so, some work that uh, Gary and uh, Kira Chifi uh, uh, pioneered a few years ago. Okay. Realize I'm running very slow on time. Um, yeah, OK. I'm a little bit behind, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep going. But so that's the idea of persistent homology. It is being applied in string theory in very nice contexts, and it uncovers the structure of the data. Something else you might want to do is search. Uh, one way to do that is via something called reinforcement learning. The key idea is to win the game, and that's an exact solution to the problem. There is zero error. The basic idea is that you have some agent here that interacts with an environment. It perceives a state from state space, and given a state in state space, you want some sort of policy function pi that gives you, given a state, gives you an action that you should take. It picks an action given the state. In the process, it uh, receives a reward. The su successive rewards can accumulate into something that's called the return. And there's various statistical ways to measure the value of the state based on studying how much reward you would get if an agent started from that state over and over again and experienced many trajectories through state space. So this is the subject of reinforcement learning. This is, uh, where, this is the subject where these famous examples in chess and Go come from. They're trying to search for something. In the case of Go and chess, they're trying to search for a winning state where they beat their opponent. So this was something that uh, we got interested in a few years ago. Uh, we applied it to type 2a compactifications with intersecting D6 brains. 
Two things to note about this plot is that uh, the agent learns TC is tadpole cancellation, add the K and you get K theory constraints and add the S and you get Susie constraints. As it learns more and more on this axis, there's sort of these punctuated equilibria where it gets stuck for a while and then there's this jump and it learns how to satisfy the Susie condition. Uh, one thing that's important to know about this is that these games, because you can roll out the agent, you can see trajectories through state space that it plays as it does more and more. Uh, you can study the statistics of what it does and see if it's learning particular types of strategies that you can actually understand. So in the context of chess, it learns openings that grandmasters have come up with. It also learns strategies that uh, grandmasters typically don't play. In the context of type 2a compactifications, there's this uh, thing that is called using filler brains to try to sop up the tadpole. And this is actually something that the agent did in a particular iteration of the game, where it was learning a strategy that humans had come up with prior. There's uh, other ways that we do search in, uh, in, in string theory and others with genetic algorithms where we simulate natural selection by evolving solutions using mutation, crossover, and selection. Of course, when you do that, then at every stage, there's some sort of survival of the fittest. where We have some new child uh, of strong parents that is presumably strong, uh, and then you get rid of the weaklings. There's also something called quantum annealers that uses uh, uh, quantum tunneling on something called D-Wave hardware that does some sort of, uh, some sort of search problem of, uh, uh, of various hard optimization problems in physics. So uh, here's some very early work in these directions uh, from many years ago from Fernando and Steve Abel. Uh, in uh, a more modern context, I really like the, the title of this paper. Uh, this is Andre and company uh, decoding nature with nature's tools, heterotic line bundle models of particle physics with genetic algorithms and quantum annealing. One of the things as we do more and more search problems in string theory with these techniques, so we want to try to compare and contrast the different things that are out there. So for example, this is about genetic algorithms and quantum annealing. Uh, there's also a number of works comparing genetic algorithms with reinforcement learning. But the basic idea is that these things are good for search. So the setup is heterotic E8 times E8 plus physics constraints, anomaly cancellation, spectrum, polystability, et cetera. And you'll notice that in some, uh, in some given kalabi -Yau, the genetic algorithm and the systematic scan, the genetic algorithm is finding all of the solutions, all but one of the solutions. This is the percent found. And as you use the genetic algorithm to search the space and find the solutions that satisfy physics constraints, you want to ask what percent of the systematic scan solutions has it found, but crucially, what percentage of the state space did it explore? These systematic scans, as we know, are very costly to scan over tons of stuff. And so you want some sort of algorithm that can do it more intelligently, and then you want to ask how many states did you actually see? So like in this case, for this particular manifold, it all, found all 38 of the solutions that the systematic scan did, but it, the fraction of the state space that it explored relative to that was 10 to the minus 14. Good. Um, and of course, uh, our gracious hosts have a beautiful paper on uh, using genetic algorithms to look for flux solutions uh, in the context of, I think it was uh, M-theory on K3 times K3, uh, in the context of the tadpole conjecture. And the, the results that they got with genetic algorithms support the tadpole conjecture. Uh, finally, um, Harold is here. And if you're interested in string field theory and ML, uh, you can ask him about that. He used neural networks to uh, try to distinguish the vertex and Feynman regions uh, uh, in, in string field theory, which are relevant to characterizing properties of, of uh, connected four-point functions. Very good. Um, very good. I've got 20 minutes left. Any questions on the cursory glances? Sure. So, good. Flux sampling in the context of real value things versus discrete value things that need to satisfy strong arithmetic constraints. Good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, Andreas is raising his head because he wrote a flux sampling paper very recently. On uh, did you guys you guys sampled discrete fluxes and found solutions, right? Yeah.
you're pointing out something a little more general that in many times we mock up discrete problems in string theory by some continuous approximation that might actually be a very um, bad example of the real problem and might actually uh, put you in a situation where uh, the continuous problem is just um, much easier than the potentially NP-hard discrete optimization problem would be. So you guys were able to find solutions. There are ways to try to do discrete optimization in this context, but I, I think you guys simply are not doing continuous fluxes. You're just doing optimization on discrete fluxes, right? Yeah. And these constraints are hard to satisfy, which is why you need these sorts of algorithms. A, a brute force scan of discrete fluxes in a high dimensional flux space is simply, the, the, the probability that it finds a solution is very low, which is why you need stuff like this. So it's, it's a great point, and it's, it's a rather general point, these discrete versus continuous problems. Anyone else? So I'm going to tell you about two themes in a little bit deeper look. Uh, one is what I'll call auto diff everything, and the other is a little bit about flows. So auto diff everything is uh, a slogan for differentiable science, and I'm getting more and more messages. Um, a theme in ML, uh, this is a theme in ML since differentiability opens up new algorithms and analyses. And here there's a pipeline for 2B flux vacua. Um, so auto diff everything. I said to GPT, write me two sentences explaining the basics of the slogan auto diff everything in the context of differentiable science. Be clear why it's interesting and important. The slogan auto diff everything in differentiable science advocates the widespread use of automatic differentiation, which is an ML thing, uh, a method that computationally derives uh, precise gradients of complex functions. This approach is crucial as it enables more efficient and accurate modeling in various scientific and engineering fields, significantly advancing uh, research and development through improved optimization and analysis. So that, that's all true. The, the, the big idea is that many more things than you think are differentiable. Obviously, simple differentiable functions are differentiable. But by composing those simple differentiable functions into a huge neural network, the reason ML works is because people have differentiable neural networks that they can optimize with gradient descent. Uh, and more generally, in certain complex simulations, uh, you build up a computational graph that you can differentiate through. So in particular, o solutions, numerical solutions to ODEs, if you keep track of the updates, uh, build up a computational graph that you can differentiate through. So, uh, OK, good. In the interest of time, there's ways to do this in molecular dynamics and in cosmology. I refer you to these papers. Um, but one way to do it is using something called, called JAX. And this is uh, something that people did with Flux Vacua. So uh, JAX is a Google package that is basically uh, uh, a differentiable version of NumPy that uh, has a number of nice features that speed up uh, calculations and make differentiation very automatic. So for example, just-in-time compilation converts functions to machine code at runtime, and this can give pretty big speed ups in the code. Uh, and there's some analyses of this recently. Um, various other aspects make vectorization automatic so that you can implement across many CPU cores. The basic takeaway message is that you want to use some of the libraries that have been developed by professionals in industry because people have thought very hard about how to make differentiation fast, how to make code faster by doing just-in-time compilation, and so on and so forth. So in a paper this summer, um, Sven and Andreas and Dubé uh, came up with a uh, package that is publicly available, right? Not yet, will be? OK, good. Uh, is going to be publicly available called Jax Vacua that takes some sort of Calabia orientifold, some sort of model con construction, and pipes it into an EFT module that uh, does automatic differentiation uh, to get uh, from the prepotential to be able to get uh, the scalar potential associated with flux vacua. They have some sort of sampling module, which is why I raised Andreas's uh, answer to Jonathan's question, some sort of sampling module for sampling flux vacua. Given those, those fluxes, they then need to write down the scalar potential and minimize it, and then they have some sort of filtering that they can, they can uh, uh, truncate on various things that they care about. So this is a very nice pipeline that uses one of the most popular libraries that's good for many reasons, including this auto diff, this just-in-time compilation, and, and the automatic vectorization. Uh, and this is something that they did in 2B Flux Vacua. So there's many different things that you can take in here, but in particular, uh, this is something where you guys are using uh, the Calabi Out Tools Kreutzer Skarka package and pumping it into this full EFT module to get honest to God Flux Vacua at the end of the day, stabilized complex structure, et cetera. Um, good. So maybe on this slide, the key thing to mention is that they have a way to go from Calabi Out data directly uh, to prepotentials hard coded, but then they use auto diff, as I understand it. The, the differentiation that's built into JAX to go from the prepotential to EFT. So the exact derivatives are built in there. There's no numerical derivatives, and they're not hard coding the potential, they're hard coding the prepotential. 
finally, when you look at some of the results, I mean, you can see uh, for various values of H11 and H21 and associated D3 charges, uh, they are getting millions or hundreds of thousands of vacua, depending on the, on the setup. Of course, as the number of moduli goes up, uh, the difficulty of this problem is also going up uh, uh, for a number of reasons, inc including the dimensionality, the difficulty of the optimization, et cetera. But, um, you know, this is, this is uh, adding these up. This is order 2 million flux vacua. Um, thank you. And Andreas can tell you a little bit about, um, a, a bit more about this. And in fact, here he is, and on this, uh, and many other things, he says, ask me, I know way more than Jim. So please, uh, I, I advertise uh, grilling him about this, because it's exciting work. Finally, I want to tell you about Calabia metrics and a little bit about neural network theory. So we know, I cannot emphasize enough, we know zero non-trivial compact Calabia metrics. Okay? So that is something that we do not advertise, because we might then get very hard questions from our condensed matter colleagues about, oh, you don't know the most fundamental object on your manifold? What are you doing? And we would tell them something about SUSY and calibration and what we can do, even though we don't know the metric, et cetera. And that's all very good. But we know zero, and modeling them with neural networks, which we'll hear about next, gives state-of-the-art results. So uh, in this context, what I want to ask is, the training the neural network, which drives you towards the Calabia metric, corresponds to some sort of geometric flow in the space of metrics. And it encompasses some famous results in mathematical physics. And so I want to give some sort of theory underlying these compact Calabia metrics. So um, since there's a whole talk on this next, I will just say that what our uh, friends so brilliantly did is they said, let the neural network be the metric. The reason this is a good idea is because neural networks are very, very good function approximators. So you, somewhere in that neural network space, there's something very close to the Calabia metric. And that is absolutely what they find in practice. 15 minutes with a neural network, uh, depending on details, it would cost you about 30 years with Donaldson's algorithm for numerical approximation. This is also the same sort of thing that condensed matter physicists do with ML in the context of finding quantum many body ground states, which is also a very hard problem. Okay, good. So what's happening is that there's some Calabia metric that we would like to know so that we can do physics that we haven't been able to do before. At time zero, there's some initial neural network that's very far away from the Calabia metric, and you follow the gradient of some scalar functional L, and you do gradient descent to try to arrive at the Calabia fixed point. This is what Magdalena's talk is on. If you were to restart your code and use a different random seed, you would start somewhere else in, uh, in metric space, and you would find a metric flow towards the Calabia fixed point. And you could restart your code again and find another metric flow towards the Calabia fixed point. But very famously, flows in the space of metrics is something that mathematicians study. This is Richard Hamilton, and this is Alexander Hamilton. But Richard Hamilton, uh, in the 1980s, developed something called Ricci flow. And when I first started telling people about uh, my friend's brilliant work, they, I often got the question, how do these neural network metric flows that converge to Calabia relate to Ricci flow? Because Ricci flow is a fixed point of uh, Sorry, the Calabia metrics are a fixed point of Ricci flow, just as whatever happening is happening here. And when you look at this, this is the gradient of a scalar functional. This on the right-hand side does not look in any obvious way like the gradient of a scalar functional. Um, and so a priori, until I, we thought about it harder, we just realized that these, these things probably are very different. But actually, Perelman's work in the 2000s that uh, was one of the first steps that led to him proving the Poincaré conjecture, is that he showed that Ricci flow after a time-dependent diffeomorphism is the gradient of a scalar functional. So there's a version of Ricci flow that fits better into this story. And so um, what, okay, so there's, there's some result from neural network theory called the neural tangent kernel that makes things rather tractable. Um, this is uh, the object this is sort of the fundamental, one of the fundamental objects that governs from a learning perspective what is happening uh, uh, in, in the context of these updates. Um, so, so what we did recently is to take this ML theory and to, in the case that the neural network is not some scalar function f, but is representing some two index tensor, some metric g, we applied this theory in the context of, of metric flows uh, to be able to come up with a theory of metric flows. And in general, what I would emphasize is that uh, this, uh, this bit of the story here is the general equation that would come from any neural network. In a certain infinite width limit, this object theta, which in principle is very complicated, it involves a sum over all of the parameters, and generally there's like hundreds of thousands or millions of parameters. 
what, what the main ML theory result is, is that this object in a certain infinite width limit becomes very tractable, and it becomes, in that limit, a computable fixed function that you can just compute once and for all. And what that means, um, what that means is that, uh, uh, is that you can then simplify the dynamics significantly, you can, uh, and, and then sort of start to ask the question, can we relate this to Perelman's formulation? So Perelman's formulation of the Ricci flow involves uh, the gradient of some scalar functional that's effectively Einstein dilaton theory. The neural network metric flow story is up here. And what we were able to show is that there's ways to make architecture choices and loss function choices that realize Perelman's formulation of Ricci flow exactly as a neural network metric flow. Um, so, so do some architectures yield Perelman's result? And the answer is that it, it does. One crucial thing that you need to do is include, induce locality in the flow to collapse this integral in, via a delta function into something with local updates. But there's all sorts of technicalities I can mention. But the punchline is, is that we know how to real, realize Perelman's story in that context. And I lost my slide. Huh? Yes, yeah, so um, <laughs> talk is over. Oh, Thank you very much, Tim. <laughs> Yeah, so the warnings you were getting is uh, actually uh, the, the light bulb uh, needs oh, yeah. to be replaced. So this means that the talk is actually over now. The, the lamp will be replaced. That's microphone, yeah. Uh, so I have a question. Of, I think, thanks for the great talk. Uh, I had a question about the, um, the convergence of the neural network flow. So, so you have a kind of, I think, a guarantee that it, it converges to something. But in the context of other neural networks, often you hit like a, a local, you know, extrema or something like yeah. that. And there's no guarantee that the, the loss function is kind of converging to the absolute minimum across the entire uh, yes. uh, landscape of weights. Absolutely. So, so what's, what's the guarantee here that you actually hit the honest to God uh, Calabi-Yau metric and not just something that's a, you know, rough approximation of it? Yeah, that's a, that's a, that's a great question. So first of all, on the local minimum question, one thing that, that various optimization techniques, including stochastic gradient descent, is in escaping those local minima, but that doesn't guarantee that you get all the way to the global minimum. So there are two comments there. One of them is that in practice, what people are finding is that they're getting way better gains in the losses than anyone's ever gotten before. And then when they do physics calculations associated with that, um, the physics intuition that they get is matching, the physics intuition that they have is matching what the metric gives them. So that is like a, physics proof in quotes. But in principle, what you would really want, I mean, this is in principle some solution that is supposed to be nearby, in air quotes, to the actual calabi metric. And what a PDE's person would do, and what PDE's people actually do in different contexts, is they use a neural network to find something that's close to the right solution. And then in certain cases, there's someone at Brown named Javier Gomez Serrano. He takes an approximate solution to the PDE, and then he can prove some theorem that there's something close by that actually does that. We do not have that in the calabi case, and if someone learns how to do that, that'd be very important. But I guess the capture could also be that maybe I don't even care about the exact metric. If I can calculate the Yukawa's or whatever, yeah. approximation, who cares if I had the right one? I mean, that, would that be their answer? I, I mean, I, 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 yeah, good. I mean, That's um, if, awesome. that is definitely the yeah, physics yeah, answer. All right, fine. I didn't find any real metrics, but I don't care. Yeah, yeah. if it's 1% on the Richie Flint metric, why do you care? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Absolutely, particularly in cases where you can do some physics calculations that you couldn't do before, and it makes sense and matches intuition. So there's a paper by Fabian and Ashmore on, on level crossing of KK modes as you move in the moduli space. And, and you know, maybe this is further from the Calabi metric that we want, but it's sort of matching intuition. You know, there's various towers doing various cool things. And, yeah. Certainly from the point of view of rigor, like at a, at a math level, it's not there. Who knows?
Hi, thanks for the talk. So, when you talk about the, um, the rich flow and the comparison with the neural network, yes, uh, are you using the Perelman's functional as a loss uh, to get that, or? Yeah. Okay. Oh wow, I got okay. my slides back. Great. So, so. Um, and then I'll bring in an interview. Huh? Okay, good. Well, what, what? Yeah, good. So the, the one crucial step is to to pass from here to here. You take an infinite width limit. And this object that is basically impossible to do anything with becomes perfectly tractable. And then you make architecture choices to induce a delta function and kill the mixing between the components here. And that moves you to a, what we call a local metric flow. Now you're in a world where it's starting to look like Perelman. And then there's some remnant piece of the MTK and you basically have to choose the loss function to be Perelman's functional over that thing. And then you get Perelman bang on. So the, the crucial step is first of all in getting locality and killing component mixing to get to what the sort of thing mathematicians consider. And then you need a loss function choice, which is Perelman's function. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Wait for the mic. Can you, now that we have this back, can you tell us something about the Bayesian story that you're going to tell us? The Bayesian story. Good. I can. I will be super fast here. Um, random matrix theory is a very interesting idea. This is part of my dream section. Okay. Um, what people have done is draw random matrix ensembles and have them be toy models for Lagrangians. From a machine learning perspective, this is what we would call an untrained generative model. It generates toy models for string data, but it wasn't actually trained on any string data up here. And so what one would want to do is do some sort of ML training to come up on string data to come up with some generative model for string data that simulates string data. If you had such a thing, this is a very baby step paper that we had a couple of years ago that was like an in-principle proof of, uh, of the idea. But if you had that, what you might then doing is uh, imagine doing is, is um, doing some Bayesian inference. So the method by which we update data to update, uh, we use data to update our belief in a model is statistical inference. This is actually the most famous work uh, uh, by Witten, the best cited work by Witten. It's his daughter, not Edward. <laughs> um, uh, and in strings, you might imagine a statistical pipeline for this. So this is all very futuristic. But what you might imagine is that you use ML-based methods trained on string, string data to draw from some approximate distribution on string data, ideally the full cosmological measure. You would then use string techniques, traditional things to compute observables, and use something called simulation-based inference to compute the data-conditioned Bayesian posterior. This is uh, the sort of thing that is the right way to do, to do Bayesian inference. Um, and then you can make predictions in the posterior. So, Simulate string th theory to get draws from the prior. Use simulation-based inference to get the posterior that's conditioned on data, and then see how the posterior makes different predictions from the prior. Finally, um, I do think it's worth mentioning that uh, Jonathan has this nice paper. A concern that he raised here and um, in, in conversations that we had some, some time back is even if you can do all this, there's a fundamental concern, which is from statistical learning theory, there, there's just a question, given a statistical model, how much can you learn about the full theory, that is the UV data, from a finite number of IR experiments. And so that's a learning theory question, and um, he probably has much more to say about it than I do. But this is the way that I might imagine doing Bayesian inference. And what Cody and I did was the very first baby step on step one, but one could try running the whole pipeline. So it would be like addressing the initial problem with the last uh, I, I, I uh, could. So, you could imagine sampling from any prior here. So if you could simulate from some prior that someone else comes up with, um, uh, you could do the whole thing, and then it would be conditioned on the prior that you drew your string data from. What you really want to know, in my opinion, is the correct cosmological measure on string vacua. That's a very loaded, hard to compute, hard to understand thing. But if you had that, then you would want to come up with draws from that measure and then run the standard Bayesian inference story. And I think that one of the points of that is that if you were able to simulate that, if you were able to have an ML method that would spit out Lagrangians drawn from the right measure, then you would just study the appropriate statistics of those Lagrangians and see if it matches data and, and condition on it. So yes, if, if you had the oracle back and he could tell you the measure, you would want it and you'd want to learn to do that. But um, well, I think we're many years from that. <laughs> Yeah, maybe a general question. What do you think about demonstrating swamp plan conjecture with these techniques? Like, yeah, the, for example, the distance conjecture. Uh, good. So I, I think, I, I'm forgetting the details, I think Nana Cabo Vizay wrote a paper about that a couple of years ago. Maybe not the distance conjecture. But um, 
I've been trying to emphasize that sampling is important. Uh, many swampland papers come up with a conjecture and draw a line for some inequality and then populate some points from string theory and say, look, it's all below the line, right? But what you would like to be able to do if you, uh, if you ML'd it was come up with some ML technique that learns adversarially how to sample string data that is increasingly close to violating a swampland conjecture. So if your line is here and your samples generally come down here, you, want, you would like to have some sort of ML technique that tries to drive you towards the boundary. And then if, you know, if you're doing tons of sampling right here and you can't, really can't get over, it lends some credence to the idea that it's really a theorem. And if you get over, then you either need to modify your conjecture or throw it out. Um, but I think there's only been one paper on that and it was some time ago. Thanks. Bias towards the what the data that was trained on. Right? Uh, so sorry, I, I, the, in the swampland case. Yeah. Yeah, that's. Um, because the that, whole that's point absolutely there true. Is more generalize it. Gen yes, if I kind of already know that in that case it's true, then yeah. how am I going to beat it if I the things that I already know? It's kind well, of like a loop. So, so part, one of the reasons that it's not just a loop is that something that you can do is that you can iterate your training many times. And in the training, you can build in a notion of how far you are from the boundary. And you can do something called active learning, which is to systematically, over time, add, in, add more and more training data that is closer and closer to the boundary. So in, in some sense, exactly what you're, yes, there is an initial bias. But what you're really trying to do is to bias the model to learn to draw from as close to the swampland boundary as possible. So um, it, it's, it's basically built into the learning algorithm. And to, to avoid the loop that you're worried about, I would say what you should do is use active learning and add to your training data the examples that are close to the boundary, so it biases in that direction. I'd say in the interest of time, we continue over coffee, and we meet back at uh, 11.30. And that's, thank Jim again.